Welcome back to the In The Blues Tone podcast. It's April the 18th, 2019. Coming up to mid-year, which is getting kind of scary because I turned 40 in June. I can't believe it, man. The years are flying by, especially from 30 to 40. Feels a whole lot quicker from 20 to 30 did. So anyway, that aside, if you're new to the podcast and you enjoy it, you can also find it on iTunes or any of that type of software, or you can also listen to it in audio form at inthebluespodcast.com. It's free to listen to there as well. And if you're new to this particular podcast or my channel, welcome aboard. I should also point out, I also list the topics in the description of the video and also in the pinned comment section, so you can skip ahead if you so choose. With all of that said, let's get into the first topic, which is the 2019 Gibsons. They're great. <laughs> I really, really like them. I've played three so far, an SG, the Les Paul Junior DC, which is the double cut one with a single P90, fantastic guitar, and, a, and their Gibson Flying V which I ended up purchasing. I'm, I'm like stunned at how great it sounds. In terms of my humbucker guitars, I would put that equal up with my PRSSE in terms of, of tone. Now, they're both very different guitars quality-wise and how it feels in the hand. The Gibson's a nicer guitar than the SE, but I love that SE guitar. It's been my favorite gigging guitar now for quite some time, and it still is. It's like a really great guitar, but the V is every bit as good just different, you know, it's hard to sort of compare them being that they're two separate instruments. But I just think, you know, the, the fit and finish on the Gibson is a pretty beautiful thing. I like it so much, I, I just had to buy it. It took me 40 minutes of playing it in the shop, trying to find a problem, you know. I've had a lot of Gibsons over the years that had a lot of problems. Not every single one of them had problems, but I've had experiences where, you know, I was like, I don't know how to fix this, so I got rid of it. Now I know a lot more about guitars. I probably could have fixed some of those issues. But the point being is this. Straight off the shelf, straight out of the box, they all played well. Every single one of them that I've played. Well, the three that I've played. A couple of days back, I went into a store with Dr. Rick as well. And he got to play some. And they, he said the same thing. They all play really well. Look how great these are. And that's not always the case. I've played some absolute dogs straight off the shelf. Uh, and these 2019 ones, I think Gibson are back. Let me know your thoughts if you've had a chance to play them. I'm not saying every single year prior to that was was nasty or anything like that, but my experience with them was I kind of sort of dismissed them for a while, ended up going the Japanese guitar route, which I love Tokai and other Japanese instruments as well. But it feels great to sort of say confidently that I really think Gibson are making some great guitars again. For me, being a lefty, not only finding... Uh, new ones in the range is awesome, but also finding ones that play well. Usually, as a lefty, the setups are done probably by people who aren't left-handed. That would be my assumption. I could be wrong about that, but generally, you pick them up and you're like, this needs work. And to buy a new guitar, you know, you can expect to maybe set up the action to your liking, but sometimes they just don't play well at all. And I've had that experience, especially with an older 335 that I had. It was It was not very good. So... I'm back in the Gibson Club. I have a Flying V. I love it. If you missed that video, I'll leave a link up in the cards and you can check it out. So there you have it. Please let me know in the comments what you think of the 2019 Gibsons. If you've had a chance to play one, if you've already purchased one or if you're considering getting one, let me know. I love my Flying V. I've now played it live three times and it puts a smile on my face. It's probably the nicest pairing for my Marshall DSL 40 CR amplifier. Sounds just spectacular. I'll be posting some live clips of that particular guitar in the mix, in a band mix coming up soon. So stay tuned for that. So one thing about me is I love changing speakers in amplifiers to try to get the best tone possible, to try to maybe make them louder or a bit more this or a bit more that. The problem with it is it's a massive rabbit hole once you start getting into it because you just think, oh, what about this? Or what about that? So I've had a couple of main or favorite speakers now for a while, and I've spoke about these in length, the Eminence Swamp Thing and the Eminence Texas Heat. Both are great speakers. Now, when I bought my Marshall DSL40CR, it came with a Celestian V-type speaker, which was a decent speaker. I then changed it over to the Texas Heat for one day, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to put the other one back in. And then I was like, oh, I don't know if I like this stock speaker as much as the Texas Heat. So I started looking around online. I bought one called the Tonka. And if you haven't seen that video, it's posted on my channel. I'm sure you'll find it. So the Tonka was a really, really loud speaker. It almost made the amplifier 
a little too loud and maybe unusable at certain types of gigs I was doing, which is great. If you want a, a, your amp to be louder, get an Eminence Tonka, but it also made the amp so, so much heavier. It's a couple of kilos, I think, heavier than the Texas Heat or something like that. It's got a big magnet on the back and it weighs a ton. Just getting it from the car up the steps into the venue, especially while I'm waiting on knee surgery, wasn't a great move, right? So I ended up ripping that speaker out. It was a little bit too clean as well. I kind of lost maybe the tone that I was looking for in my head. So you know what I did? <laughs> I put the Texas Heat back in. And this time I tried it. Now, I should also point out where I play a lot of the time, the one side of the stage is great. The other side of the stage we call the black hole. And that's because the sound doesn't escape properly. The first time I tried the Texas Heat, I didn't think it was bright enough for whatever reason. And I was like, oh, I don't know if this is the right sort of speaker for that amplifier. I then tried it on the other side of the stage and I fell in love with it. And not long after that, I played a festival with it and I was like, this is the speaker. It's not coming out. So for those wondering what's happening to the Texas Heat or the Marshall amplifier, I'm leaving the Texas Heat in there. It's a really great mix. I know a couple of other guys that run uh, an Eminence Texas Heat with a Marshall head and they love it. And I was like, yeah, that might actually work. So I'll give that a shot. The reason I went back to the Texas Heat is simple. It's more the sound I've got in my head. It rolls out a little bit of the top end, but in that particular Marshall amp, if you're familiar with Marshalls, they can get pretty bright. And I don't like super bright, ice picky tone. I like high headroom tone, but I also don't like it to be too like teeth shattering. You know, that, that that's not a whole lot of fun. So this particular speaker is now back in the Marshall and I'm done. I'm not going to do any more changeovers with the Marshall for any time in the future. If I do need the Texas Heat for something else, I'll buy another one and put it in another amplifier. But I really think that's great. So what am I going to do with the Tonka? You know what? I'm going to try it in the Artist Tweed Tone 20 amplifier. Now that comes stock with a 7080 and for whatever reason, the 7080 sounds so good in that amp. I love that little amplifier. And I'll get to that, you know, something else about that amplifier coming up on the podcast. But I'm thinking, hmm, maybe I could make it even louder by putting the Tonka in there. And because it's already a small amp, that extra couple of kilos or pounds or whatever won't matter too much because it's already a super lightweight amplifier. So I'm going to try it in that. We might do a video about it coming up and see if it kind of retains the tone. Being that the voicing of that tweed tone is, you know, that sort of tweed, sort of pushed mids kind of sound, it, although it can go heavily into dirty territory as well, it's got somewhat of a tweed sort of pushed mids thing going on. So I think maybe that might suit the Tonka speaker better than it suited the Marshall. So we'll see how we go. But as of right now, I'm really happy with my tone in terms of the Marshall and the Texas Heat. And if you saw the clip I posted as the years go passing by on my channel from the festival, that was the exact setup I was using, the Texas Heat and also the Marshall. No pedals other than a delay, which was the Citec delay going in through the effects loop. So that was it. Nice and simple. And the Texas Heat has found a home. If you're a regular to the live streams that I do, or if you follow me on Instagram, you always see there's always stuff I'm getting rid of or I talk about sort of clearing house. So the big gear purge officially began a few weeks back, actually. I've already sold quite a few things with some more stuff on the way out. So there's one thing I've got to confess, and this breaks my heart to say this, and I'm sure a lot of people won't want to hear this, but if you haven't heard, I sold one PV Bandit. I can't believe it. Well, you know what? I can believe it. You know why? Because I've had three of them. Will I get a fourth down the track? Most likely. But as of right now, I don't have a PV Bandit. It wasn't getting used. The Artist Tweet Tone 20 was basically the replacement amplifier in many ways to the PV. It might not be quite as loud, but it's lighter, and I can get a great tone out of it without any pedals. So for me, going to a jam night, the Artist Tweet Tone 20 is by far loud enough. It is just a really loud little amp. It's got all the gain I could use. And the PV just wasn't getting used, you know? So I don't like stuff just sitting around. If I'm not playing it, if I'm not taking it out and taking it to a jam night or a gig, it means it's not getting used. I could have just keep it and use it on the channel, but I've always got the profiles I made on the Kemper too. So if I ever need to use those, I can, I can do that. But I just don't have a lot of floor space for a lot of amplifiers. I'm actually even thinking of selling the Marshall 2x12. I've got that laying sideways, so upright right now because... 
this room is way smaller smaller than it probably looks on camera. I'm not too sure if it looks like a large room, but it isn't, right? It's not too much further that way. So, yeah, it's a pretty small room. And for me, just to be able to keep amps and stack them up behind me, and it's not really the vibe I want to go for either. So will I end up with another PV Bandit down the track? Most likely, but as of right now, I don't have one. I sold the Studio Pro maybe two, two or three months, oh, about two months ago now, I reckon, something like that. Uh, I just wasn't using that either. And w once I got the tweed tone, I realized, ooh, this is pretty much a killer for most of my amplifiers. And I just don't think I need it. The other reason I want to get rid of this Marshall back here, this 2x12, is I think I'll just downsize and get a single 12 or something like that, which is what I wanted in the, in the beginning anyway. But I thought, I'll get this. I got a great deal on it, but it's just it's overkill for this room. When I was shooting the videos of the Marshall... Uh, Studio Classic JCM 800, it was so loud. It was just unbearable. I should have stuck to my guns and shopped around more and got a single 12, but, you know, this thing's basically brand new. I don't think I'll have too many problems selling it. So what else am I going to get rid of? There's lots of pedals that will be going out as well. I've just got to list those. Doing that is so time-consuming and it's not enjoyable, but I really need to start listing them. And I'm going to be selling a whole lot of... More of my inexpensive guitars that I'm just not playing. It's time for a lot of those to go. Um, and they'll be mostly, I think, like the SX guitars. I'm probably flip one of the Dan Electros as well. It's just not getting played. It sits in the cupboard doing absolutely nothing. My rule with guitars, and everyone's different. Some people like, you know, having 15, 20 guitars or whatever. But I'm getting a lot of stuff in as of right now. And that'll probably stop after today actually i don't foresee anything else coming in in the near near future at least anyway so i'm going to keep the ones that i like and that are different enough for me to keep it in the collection and anything i've got doubles or triples of so if i've got a couple of tallies i'm not using but i've got one other another one like a third one that i play a lot i'll keep that one maybe flip the other two or something like that so you're going to see a downsize in a lot of the more inexpensive guitars it was a good experience playing them and being able to compare, say, the SX versus the Harley Bentons versus the Artist Guitars. And I've got one other video coming up, which will go live after this, not on the same day, but coming up, six different guitars to one actual track. So I hope you like that as well. That's kind of like the, you know, some of those will go, some of those will stay too, definitely. Like the Harley, I really think the Harley Benton guitars are great. Uh, there's no questions about that. I'm going to talk about one of those in just a moment as well, even though that video hasn't gone live yet. I, I really want to have a chat about it, maybe uh, tell you why I think it's so good as well. Now, I don't get paid for my reviews. Uh, no company saying, hey, here's 100 bucks. Say positive things about that. If you've been a long-term subscriber to the channel, you'll know this as well. I always criticize stuff. And we're going to criticize uh, as something else coming up in just a moment. So the gear purge has officially begun. And I hope to move some of this stuff by June if I can. And of course, if there's anything that you've seen that you want and, you know, you can come get it or I can meet you somewhere, let me know. Happy to offload, uh, you know, something to you if you're local to Melbourne as well. So keep that in mind. All right, it's time for the official first in the blues rant. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into it. So it's come to my attention that there are so many gimmicks when it comes to guitar products out there. And I'm really getting sick of having to have a phone to connect to stuff. There's a couple of reasons why I don't like this approach. One, software can become outdated really quickly in two ways. The developer not, might not update their software. And once, say, Apple update their operating system, they encourage all of their developers the third-party developers to update their software or some stuff doesn't work. So you've got that working against you. Now, I should make the, the point clear that I actually don't mind a phone being used in conjunction with something that can work without the phone. So if you've got something like a Fender Mustang, a Marshall Co., one of those new X BT Lite amplifiers, those little practice amps, which I think are fantastic, all of those products come with first-party apps. So, you know, they've got a software developer on their team that makes the apps and you can download it and it works. Anytime you're relying on a third-party application to make something work and it won't work without an app or your phone being connected, it's just a huge pain in the ass. I can't stand having to have a phone sort of relied upon to get a product to work. I don't know how you guys feel about this, but 
I'm really starting to feel like if you rely on an application to utilize something for guitar playing, it's too much of a distraction. Think about all the messages, the emails, all the app notifications, all that kind of stuff as well, taking you away from playing guitar. If you're playing guitar, put your phone down. Now, is it all bad? No, it's not. There are some cool things about having a phone connected to an amp. If it works properly, you can stream music and jam along. I think that's pretty cool. But anytime you rely on your phone to give give you all the sounds of to an amp or whatever it is that you're using, it kind of sucks. And, and it sucks for those reasons I mentioned. App development, operating system, upgrades that might op make them obsolete and not work. All these things are just no good. Now, like I said, if they've usually first party apps are pretty reliable. And the thing I like about the Fender Mustang, whether you like the amp or not, is the fact you don't need your phone. You know, you can go over to the amp, you know, dial in everything manually just with the on-screen, you know, LED that's there. So you don't necessarily need your phone. It, it's helpful, but you don't need it. Really have a good think if you're thinking about buying something that relies really, really heavily on your phone to the point where you can't actually make these adjustments from the actual amp or whatever it is that you're buying. I really feel like this is a huge Achilles heel of a lot of products and they just make them way too fiddly. All of these things just add up to an absolute mess in my opinion. If the apps aren't kept up to date, the product won't work. If you've got a certain version of the operating system on your phone that might not be compatible with the app, it's not gonna work. And then you can't actually use the unit. So in my opinion, make sure if you buy something that requires or that has Bluetooth connectivity, Make sure you can still use it without it to at least 50% of its functionality. That would be a huge thing. I love the fact that on the new X BT Lite, that little practice amp I did a review for, the fact that you can just plug into it and play, you don't need your phone, but if you load up your phone, you get some more options, but at least you can still use it. So even if the app becomes obsolete, you've still got something you can use. I think, you know, at least that's cool. So yeah, let me know what you think of this. This has been something that's been bugging me more and more over the last... I don't know, at least 12 months and more so <laughs> over the last couple of months. If you've seen any of my videos, you'll know why. If you missed that video, I'll leave a link up in the cards. Since starting this YouTube channel all those years ago, a huge part of the audience here definitely likes budget guitars. And if you're into that, this particular topic is for you. Or if you're just looking for a guitar to have as a backup to something else that you use, I think I've just found the best budget or inexpensive guitar out there. Now, inexpensive to me might be different to inexpensive to the next guy. You know, someone might buy a $40,000 car and think, hey, oh, that's inexpensive. I'm used to driving a $100,000 one. You know, that's not me, by the way. But, you know, you get my point. Everyone's financial situation is a little bit different. So I'm going to come at this from my perspective and from the guitars I've had a comparison or direct comparison to. I think I found the best inexpensive guitar I've ever played and it's shocked me how good it is and it's sitting right behind me. So this video is not up just yet. It is scheduled so you'll definitely get a video about this coming up. Here's the guitar I'm talking about. This is the Harley Benton CST 24T electric guitar in black flame. I love this look. This color is fantastic. It's got a green going through it. So if you think you can see green and black, that's kind of what it is. It's spectacular in terms of its visuals. Now, I should point out straight out of the box, it's played perfectly. I did a live stream. I always like to do unboxings when things come in because it's that first impressions. You know, is it good? Is it set up properly? Is it damaged? All that kind of stuff. These are things I want to know. Uh, and I, then I can help advise other people. You know, what, what's my experience with something once it comes in? If it's is good or bad? And we've had both on the channel. If you follow my live unboxings, you'll know not everything goes to plan. Some stuff doesn't work. Some stuff works. Some stuff is great. And this is by far the best inexpensive guitar I've ever played. Now, I'm a huge fan of the PRS SE Custom 24, which is basically kind of what this is. But there's a couple of main differences between this and the PRS from what I can tell already. So the first thing that's different, obviously the color, I, I actually think this looks better. Um, it's all subjective stuff. The other thing too is the single, you can split coil the humbuckers, right? And I've got to tell you that the split coil on this actually sounds a little bit fuller than the PRS SE, which is good because I, I feel like, and as I mentioned in my review of the SE, split coil tones, eh, they were all right, but they weren't great. These feel more legitimate. I, I Yeah, it's got a Wilkinson bridge. The whammy bar works really, really well. Also, you can get all the way up to the 24th fret, no problems at all. 
And the humbucker tone on this kills. I love the bridge pickup. This might be my favorite bridge pickup out of the majority of my guitars, with the exception of maybe two or three uh, of my higher end guitars. But this, as a budget guitar, is better than any other guitar I've ever played. So how does this compare to, say, the Harley Benton TE52? It's a very different guitar in terms of how it feels in the hand. The neck's not quite as big. It's it's quite a chunky guitar in terms of its weight as well. But it just it's a really great guitar. If you're into rock and blues and any of that kind of stuff, this would be a really great choice. Now, I love the Telecaster. I think it's one of their better guitars as well. And that's even cheaper than this. But in terms of how this looks, how it plays, the type of tones you can get out of it and who it might appeal to, I think it's great. You know, it's got that very PRS kind of vibe about it. And having owned and still owning a, a PRS Custom 24, I really feel like this is easily on par, but maybe slightly nicer to look at visually. I, I Like I said, I love the Trampus Green. I, I'm not getting rid of my PRS at all. Not a chance, but this would make a great, perfect backup guitar to that if I ever need to take it with me. I just think this is a really awesome instrument. So I'll leave some links in the description. If you want to check this out, go ahead. You can also wait for my review as well. It's coming up. I've also recorded a brand new backing track for it and tried to pull some really great tones and I think I nailed it. So yeah, let me know if you've had a chance to already play one of these or test one. This guitar is, it's just simply stunning to look at. No doubt about it. You know, it just really plays great. The binding, everything. So I'll leave some links in the description. You can check them out. Recently on the channel, I had a chance to review the JCM 800 from Marshall. It's one of the new Studio Classic 20 watt heads, switchable down to five, and I had a chance to use it through my Marshall 2x12 box. And I'll give you my tonal thoughts about it after the fact and also hearing it in a different room. So what you heard on that video was pretty much what I was hearing in the room. It's bright. It's a really, really bright amplifier. And a lot of people are saying, oh, how does it compare to the DSL that I've got? Two very, very different different amplifiers. Uh, I'm also going to touch on something that I saw in the comment section, which I was completely obliv oblivious to. But in terms of how it compares to my Marshall DSL-40, I feel like the Marshall DSL is still a more versatile amplifier. I don't know if it's a better sounding amp. It's just different. And better is subjective to what you like. So for me personally, what I like, and now that I've got that Texas heat speaker in there, that's the sound that really appeals to me. It's not quite as bright not quite as piercing. It has reverb built in. I've got, you know, two very similar channels. I can use the two crunch channels, a clean channel, as well as an ultra gain channel, which I don't use, but it's there in case I want to troll someone who's using it on stage and then just push the button in and I get the Carlos tone. <laughs> I've done that at jams. So yeah, look, for me personally, I think I still prefer the Marshall DSL. And I got to tell you how robust that amp is. I did a festival recently and as I, as I was wheeling the amp back to the car, the amp fell forward and slid on the road. And I thought, if this works after I get it home, it's going to be fine. And it was fine. I've used it live since then as well. So in terms of build quality, it's really robust, which brings me to a point that a few people mentioned about the JCM 800, how if you have something going through the effects loop and you turn that effect on, you hear a clunk or a click come through the actual amplifier. I didn't notice that. <laughs> I don't know if I just got one that worked or what, but... The reverb pedal that I was using was a foot switch, foot switchable reverb pedal. I turned it on in the video. You didn't hear anything. That's I didn't cut anything out. I just walked, went over and hit, turned it on, and there it was. So I didn't notice any clunk or anything, but a lot of people are having problems with that. I don't know if it's universal to all of them or whether Marshall had sorted that out or anything like that, but this is one thing that I didn't notice, and I didn't have any issues running pedals into that amp either so in terms of how it sounds running pedals into it i almost feel like the only pedal you need with that jcm 800 other than a reverb if you want one is a volume boost pedal i don't think the tube screamer sounded as good as the volume boost pedal so having a great drive channel like that plug in and just push it over the edge with a volume boost it's all you really need now you can of course wind out some of that brightness that was there but it's kind of inherent in that particular sound. And that's kind of why I'm opting to use my DSL-40. Now, also, I went to the shop and Dr. Rick was gassing bad after he saw the video. So we went in and had a listen. And we got to compare it to a couple of the other Marshall amps that were in there. And we both felt like, wow, this is bright. 
So it also comes down to a few factors. Uh, the room you're in makes a huge difference in where you're standing or sitting, all that kind of stuff. You know, if you're watching videos about it, it will come down to the mic placement. I never mic up dead center on a speaker. I think that's the worst thing you can do in terms of top end. It's just horrible. So I usually opt to the edge. So if I had it mic'd up in dead center of the cone, you probably would have heard even more brightness. So it's one of those things. I, I like to not hear as much of that, but the recording was pretty accurate. I did have two mics actually on the cabinet that day, but in the room, it sounded huge. It was so loud. So if you're looking for you know the classic JCM sound, then go for the JCM. If you want an amp that can pretty much do anything, the DSL is the way to go. I don't have any problems with the quality control or I haven't done, had to do anything with that amplifier. It just works other than changing the speaker. If you're unsure whether or not you'll need a single 12, a 2x12 or a 4x12 or a quad box, as we call them here in Australia and maybe in England as well, then go for a head. I think it's a really great option. You can stack it up with different cabs, get a very different sound, you know. So the speakers, the box, all that kind of stuff will come into a, into some account as well, which is why I always say to people, go play them. I had so many comments saying, oh, what do I prefer, the DSL or the JCM800? I like the JCM800. I thought it sounded awesome, but it's not my type of sound. I could see anyone in a rock and roll band or a cover band doing like ACDC or something like that. Would They would love that amplifier, but the DSL, from the sound that I personally like is a better amp and it's more compact. It means I can just pick it up, walk out the door, and I'm done. I did a gig with Dr. Rick recently uh, where we were both playing and I had my amp and he had his Friedman and, you know, it was great. We were just basically not using any overdrive pedals. It's, it's awesome. And you can very simply do that with either of those two amplifiers. So trust your ears, go for the one you like the best. But in my opinion, for the kind of gigs that I do where I'm lazy and I just want to be able to walk in with a guitar in one hand, amp in another, the DSL is still my favorite even if it might not be quite as classic rock and roll as the JCM. But that said, for the blues rock stuff I play, the funk, all that kind of stuff, it's a beast. I love it, so I'm not going to buy it. <laughs> and that wraps up the In The Blues Tone podcast. It's the 18th of April, 2018. Happy Easter if you celebrate that and all that kind of stuff as well. I wanted to thank all the Patreon subscribers for their support as well. You guys have been awesome. It's been a huge help to the channel and anything that comes in through Patreon goes back into the channel and we get upgrades and things that help the channel move forward. So you might notice today I'm using a different microphone. This is the Rode Procaster microphone and this was something that I really felt like I needed to get for doing videos, for doing podcasts, all that kind of stuff. And this is sort of, you know, recirculated through the Patreon page. So if you're interested in finding out about how that works and what it is, it helps support the channel. You get access to my backing tracks, get access to behind the scenes content as well as pedal and other gear offers as well that I also post there first before I, I offload anything anywhere else. So if you want to find out about that, I'll leave some links in the description below as well. But thank you to all the Patreon subscribers. Please also, before I go, let me know what you think of the sound quality of this Rode Procaster mic. This is a dynamic microphone specifically designed for podcasting. You notice I've got this little wind filter on here right now. I think it kind of requires it. I'll probably maybe EQ a little bit of something in post. I'm not 100% certain yet how it will sound. But I've used this before on my other channel at Geeky Nerdy Techie. If you're into tech reviews, mic reviews, audio, all that kind of stuff, check it out. I'll leave a link up in the cards over here as well. I'll be adding at least one video a week, hopefully, till the end of the year on that channel as well. So, yeah. Let me know what you think of the sound quality of this. Hopefully it's good or better than what I've had in the past. And this was kind of like a requirement now that uh, I get a lot of traffic in the, in the street here. I get, I've got a barking dog next door now. And it's just one of those things that helps sort of cancel out a lot of the background ambient noise. So I think this might be the new mic. You'll see a lot coming up on the channel. It's the Rode Procaster. Paid full price for this here in Australia. But I want to thank the Patreon subscribers for making that happen. This is, like I said, this is how... It keeps the channel moving forward, and I really appreciate the support. So thank you so much. Don't forget, folks, you can listen to this in audio only at inthebluespodcast.com or also on iTunes or any of that type of software as well. Don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell if you're watching on YouTube, and I'll catch you soon. See you.